So we are in a home that was originally built in 1851, but the property was acquired in 1842 by virtue of the Armed Occupation Act. The first gentleman to do so was named uh, uh, Bird Pearson. He arrived with 30 enslaved people from Alabama where he had been a uh, plantation owner and attorney from the Carolinas into Alabama. He was one of the first to pick land in all of Central Florida under this act because of the property itself. Uh, it is on a large hill that's at 269 feet, so putting it in the top elevations of the state. And it was used primarily for agriculture. He was growing cotton, tobacco, sugar cane. But he found success because of being an attorney. They actually asked him to be the justice of the peace for the new Hernando County. Did so well at that, that after five years, he was asked to join the state Supreme Court in Tallahassee. So then he sold the property to a, the second gentleman, Francis Edrington, who then becomes the godfather of the house itself. Uh, begin construction here in 1851. Uh, and that included the main house, the three-story manor, and the annex building behind us that housed the kitchen, pantry, and apartments for the domestics. By the Civil War, he had almost a thousand acres uh, and 65 enslaved people. Uh, their quarters were the north side of the property here, about 100 yards from the main house. Edrington uh, was an attorney also from the same area of South Carolina. However, uh, he was here primarily for agriculture. It was very successful, uh, particularly in cotton and tobacco, but he had a lumber mill here on site. Uh, that lumber mill, he took all of the woods for three quarters of a mile in all directions. One is a fire break uh, with the frequent lightning that we have, but second to sell the lumber that he didn't need. He used the native pine here to construct the house and annex. Then he sold all around the country to shipbuilders, pencil companies. Uh, but out of the town of Bayport, a uh, little sleepy town near Wikiwachi, was the third largest shipping port in Florida prior to the Civil War, before they brought the railroads down. So if you come on in here, this is the more formal parlor of the house. Uh, this is a room that housed several famous guests from the fourth and final owner here, Raymond Robbins, who was involved politically at high levels with the federal government. Raymond is here in this portrait uh, above the, uh, the cabinet here. He was an attorney also by trade, but he was involved in progressive politics in Chicago, involving labor unions um, and the like. His wife, Margaret Dreyer Robbins, over the fireplace, he met in Chicago in those political circles. She was the national president of the Women's Trade Union League, and together they began to work for women's rights, workers' rights, and were big proponents of prohibition. The sister of Raymond is Elizabeth Robbins, who in her own right was a very famous actress of the 19th century and early 20th. Uh, she was a star of stage in New York, Boston, and London. She helped finance the house originally for them to move in. And although she lived in England most of her adult life, she visited here frequently, bringing several of her friends. But between Elizabeth and her brother Raymond, uh, their friends included Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Helen Keller, and J.C. Penney. All are people who visited here in the house. He was very progressive for the era uh, when he moved in in 1901 and began renovating the house. One of the first things he did is he instituted this gentleman here, Fielder Harris, as the overseer of the entire property. Uh, as an African American over white employees, it created quite a stir here in town. And in fact, his home that was right here on the property was burned by an arsonist in the early 1900s. But Raymond kept him on, and they were so close that he named his first son Raymond and daughter Margaret after the Robins, the couple that owned here. This is the gate of the house. Uh, that was right at the top of the driveway coming on in. There's still a little piece of this metal post there, in fact. 
But Robbins wanted this initially to be their winter estate where they would vacation. So he turned it in with the help from his wife to this winter wonderland. Uh, they planted all the non-natives that are here today, magnolias, azaleas, bamboo and the like, and turned this kind of into a nature center, which it still is today. Um, this family plot here that uh, we started out with tour there outside has members of the second and third families, the Edringtons and Snows. And the lady right here we'd like to talk about, Elizabeth Carr Washington. Uh, she came as a seven-year-old slave under Francis Edrington, the second owner. Uh, but she is the longest resident here, living 70 years here on the hill, uh, both as a slave and a freed woman. She uh, was able to purchase her own property at the turn of the century at a time when it was very uh, difficult for African Americans, let alone women, to own property. Uh, but she's a very fascinating part of this. She is buried a mile and a half away at the Lake Lindsay Cemetery, uh, right by the old section there where the Confederate graves are. And in fact, Fielder's wife is her daughter. So there's connections to the Fielders, uh, to the Harrises, the Cars and the Washingtons, and all of their graves are there as well. There's an obelisk to Fielder Harris and Elizabeth Carr Washington there. But this room was the more formal parlor. This would have been the area where the guests like Henry Ford and Tom Edison would come and stay. And they came down here for weeks at a time. And it is thought that their friendship with Raymond Robbins is what drove them to come down and purchase their own properties in Florida, down by Fort Myers. And in fact, J.C. Penney, who was a personal friend of Raymond's, bought property in Citrus County and turned it into a farm commune that unfortunately didn't survive the Depression. Uh, we'll enter, uh, exit out here into the main hallway. Uh, both floors of the house have wider hallways to allow for that breezeway to be used in the summer. You'll find extensive windows, doors that could be opened to allow for the big cross breezes that are here on the hill. We'll double back here to the room that had been the dining room of the house. In this dining room, we have the original hearth of the original fireplace and chimney of the house. Initially, it was a centrally located chimney. The last room and chimney in there was added in the 1920s. Um, there was a big renovation of the house in the early 2000s that was able to salvage the original wainscoting, hearth, all the trim work, doors, and hardware of the house. The only major things done was they replaced the floors of the house and the walls, uh, the old cracked plaster here. Used to be shells, right? It was, uh, it was a regular plaster on, um, on board, uh, done in the 1920s. Prior to that, it was board uh, on slats. So very unusual. A lot of times you'll find a coquina-based plaster, but this house, there was no evidence of that. Well, the Kingsley plantation uh, Kingsley had concrete had or... Yes, and, yep. yeah. and they had to hang the windows from the top. Yeah, from... now the trim that's up here is for hanging pictures. Back in that day when you had that, you would hang them from string cord or wire. Today with the drywall, we have a couple of original maps that we definitely like to display. This particular one is an original map given to Army officers that were stationed here during the Florida War, or what we today call the Second Seminole War. Where my finger is, is where we are located on the map, which happens to be about six miles north of the village of Chocachati, which was the largest known settlement of Seminoles in North America. And 12 miles north of us is the Cove of the Withlacoochee River, or Wahoo Swamp. And about 20 miles east of us is the Dade Battlefield, which today is a state park. That was the battle that started uh, the entire Second Seminole War. That was about a seven-year war, and when it ended, it started the first mass migration of people into Florida Territory through the Armed Occupation Act. And that land was amongst the first picked in all of Florida because 
of its extreme elevation, very rich and fertile soil, and natural springs on site. That first person to come here to take advantage of that was this gentleman here by the name of Bird Pearson, who was an attorney originally from the Carolinas, uh, but he went and did some holdings in Alabama and then came down here and picked that land under the Armed Occupation Act. He then sold the property uh, to a second gentleman named Francis Edrington, who brought his family of eight children and his wife, Precious Ann, down from South Carolina. And he is the man then who built the home that we're in starting in 1851. Uh, the room that we're in now was originally exterior porch. It was walled in in the 1920s. We'll enter next into the family room of the Can house. Can you explain these pianos? Do you know anything about them? These were unfortunately donated objects later on uh, through the years. The volunteer groups that have run the house had taken in donations of period pieces that not necessarily have a tie to the house, but helping give a period feel. We do have several pieces of furniture throughout the house that belong to owners, but by and large, as each of the families left, they took their furniture and possessions with them. So unfortunately, I don't have a provenance for this player piano here uh, or this organ here. How old are they? Uh, this is turn of the century, 1890s to about 1910. And this is more 1920s or 30s player here. This was music before radio. Indeed, indeed. So as we come into this room, this is the uh, less formal family room of the house where the family would come and be entertained. Uh, in this room, we talk about, uh, we have some excellent pictures about the evolution of the house. Uh, this top one here in the center is just after the end of the Civil War under the Edrington family, clearly showing the, uh, the back annex building uh, where the kitchen was housed. Uh, then it had a wall where they could go directly from the kitchen into the dining room that we just left, bringing their meals. How many slaves were here? Uh, 65 at this point. Then they need a large kitchen. Indeed, indeed. The Kinsley the kitchen was full time. Yes. From morning until dark. Yes, indeed. And more than likely here because they had quarters for the domestics right up here. There were three apartments in that level. Uh, and during Reconstruction, at the end of the Civil War, after the slaves were given their freedom here, the U.S. Freedmen's Bureau came here and built a school on the property on the north side by the lake. Uh, this school was here for about 10 years, and then they moved it, uh, the entire building, to downtown Brooksville. Uh, the middle picture here is a few years later, the third owner, uh, Joseph Snow, who was a Confederate veteran of the third floor to volunteers, he brought citrus here. He added the coppola to the observation deck on top, this widow's walk, which was used for not only uh, fire watching before the days of the state fire towers, but also in the late 1850s and 60s, the threat of Seminoles still happened to be here in the area. So I'm sure that was used a lot for security. In this room, we do have some pieces that belong to families, the roll top desk, uh, belonged to Raymond Robbins, the last owner, uh, as did these three gold, golden chairs. But the wainscoting, uh, the bench seating, and hearth are all original to the house. So that's how people kept track of the date. Indeed, that's a turn of the century desk calendar there. And I make sure every day we turn the, <laughs> turn the knobs on that, keep that. Are these Bibles? Going. Those are uh, books. Now, part of the story here uh, with Raymond Robbins, the last owner, his sister Elizabeth, uh, who helped front the money to purchase the property and renovate the house. At that time, she was a famous stage actress in New York, London, and Boston. In fact, she was trained by an actor named Edwin Booth, who happens to be the brother of John Wilkes Booth. The Booths were a very famous acting family. Edwin went on to continue on the stage, and one of his pupils was Elizabeth Robbins, the sister. She helped front the money to renovate the house, and she visited frequently uh, throughout the rest of her life. As her shelf life as an actress was starting to come to a close, she became a writer, and she wrote over 40 books and novels, 
many of which are semi-autobiographical, talking about her, her upbringing, the family, and several of them are uh, use this house and, and area. Did John Wilkes Booth come to this house? No, he was dead before any of the Robins were here. He had been killed in 1865. Uh, the Robins, when they took possession, was at the turn of the century, around 1901 to 1905. Edwin trained her in the 1880s as an actress, uh, but it's not known that any of them came down here. But Elizabeth was a very prolific writer um, one of her books, The Convert, that we have right here, one of her more famous works, is about one of her passions, which was women's rights. She was an activist, uh, actively involved from the 1880s into uh, the end of her life in the 1950s. That is an old Bible. This is. Um, although it is not of the families who lived here, the Snow family, the third family, had an almost identical family Bible. So this is another families to replicate the piece. But those are interesting because they are also not just Bibles, but a depository of family information. Families would often put their birth certificates and wedding records and the like in there. And these big hinged family Bibles were always heavily illustrated uh, with lots of plates lithographs, uh, both in color and black and white, and were always the centerpieces of, of many family rooms. This is a neat artifact that's here for sure. Uh, Raymond Robbins, the last and final owner, initially uh, had a rocky start in living in the area. He was a northerner, so kind of a distrust of Chicago Yankees coming down here especially the fact that he worked in progressive politics with labor unions and the like. But he earned a living as an economic advisor to five different presidents, uh, starting with Teddy Roosevelt in his campaign for president in the Bull Moose Party. He worked for Woodrow Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, and later Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, during the Depression, when the Robins lost a lot of their financial money, they actually donated their entire property in the house to the federal government. And in 1931, the U.S. Department of Agriculture began using the estate for agricultural research. They are still here 90 years later in the northern 500 acres here. Were any famous presidents at this house? We don't believe any of the presidents were. Uh, there were some cabinet members, uh, state senators like uh, U.S. senators like Claude Pepper, uh, and rep or, I'm sorry, he was a rep U.S. representative, but there were state officials, some federal officials, and particularly cabinet members. Who, unfortunately, names escaped me, but because of his political connections, a lot of them did indeed come down here. And he was a very big uh, personal friend of Warren Harding and Herbert Hoover, in fact. But it was that connection to the federal government um, with the president as an economic advisor that got the deal for the government to come in and take over the property, allowing the Robins to live in the house for the rest of their lives uh, tax-free. In 1936, his relationship with Franklin D. Roosevelt got a company of the Civilian Conservation Corps sent here, and they did work. Uh, they built barns, stables, and infrastructure for the USDA works. And today, there are about 16 buildings on the various properties and sites that still exist from the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, stone bridges, uh, office buildings, and the like. And so a unique part of our history there. Uh, basically, the family histories end here when Margaret passed in 1945 and Raymond in 1954. The federal government then uh, took over everything but didn't desire the actual house or immediate grounds, they donated it to the state of Florida. And this became a student retreat center, first for the University of Florida, and then in 1959, the University of South Florida. And it was USF who held the property for years, uh, building the cabins that are here today in the retreat center for their students. Uh, in 2001, they donated it to Hernando County where this became a, a county park, and a group called the Friends of Chinsega Hill uh, began to caretake the property. They were able to raise almost a million dollars in grants, 
private and public donations that helped renovate the house, uh, putting it in the great condition that it is today. Uh, today, uh, we with the Tampa Bay History Center are the caretakers of the historic part of the property. We partnered two years ago with Hernando County to provide interpretive services for the history as well as assist with the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance of the house. Is that it for inside the house? That is, yes. Okay.